crisis management. Really appreciate the opportunity to have this webinar and, and meet with everyone. My name is Dale Deering. And I've been involved in crisis management uh, for many years. Also in service development, performance management, training, auditing, risk management, etc. Some of the examples of, of crisis that I've, I've been involved with or face would be uh, terrorist attacks, fire, oxygen supply failure, flooding, uh, death of a key hospital leader on duty, hurricane, a board chair of the organization that's gone rogue, financial insolvency. These are some of the, the events. There's Sorry, I, I had a muted mic. So um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. All right, thank you, sorry about that. So thank you very much for joining um, and welcome to this webinar on crisis management. My name is Dale Deering and I've been involved in um, crisis management, service development, performance management, training, auditing, risk management for many years. And some of the events that I've been involved with would be um, terrorist attacks, um, fire, oxygen supply failure, flooding, um, a, a death of a key hospital leader on duty, a hurricane, a board chair who's gone rogue, and even financial insolvency of an organization. Today, this is a big topic. I just want to give you overview of the key elements that would go into effective crisis management. And I want to thank Kassam and Mohammed from Sustainable Management Group for the opportunity to provide this webinar. Thank you, Dave. First, a quick history. Does anyone know who said this? And this is a common failing of mankind, never to anticipate a storm when the sea is calm. This was written by Niccolo Machiavelli in about 1518 when he wrote his famous book, which is considered to be the, the foundation for the principles of modern management. He wrote his book in 1518 and he stated that those words when he was discussing the princes, two princes who had lost their cities due to their lack of preparation. And he was writing that in his famous book, The Prince. So he wrote that about 500 years ago. And then today, as Kassam was noting, there's all kinds of crisis. With the pandemic, we have natural disasters, cyber attacks, social media, damaging posts, fires, etc. And I was reading just recently a crisis preparation study where 80% of the managers and leaders surveyed predicted that their company will experience a crisis in the near future that could disrupt operations, shake their customer confidence, and plunge the stock value of their company. But only one third of the same managers and leaders said that their company was adequately prepared for a crisis, only one third. It shows that human nature has not changed and organizations are still largely unprepared, even since Machiavelli wrote those words 500 years ago. And that's why it's good to review crisis management as we are today. Topics I want to go through today, touch on defining crisis management, training leaders and staff, conducting the crisis audits, performing risk level analysis, the crisis response process, incident management techniques, business continuity and recovery. And we'll hopefully fit that into about 40 minutes. First up, definitions. What is a crisis? Crisis would be a time of intense difficulty or danger 
And it's usually or can be associated with negative, bad, destructive events or circumstances. That's usually what happens. And it's largely unexpected. What is crises? Well, that's just the plural of crisis. For example, we've had several crises this year. So I use these words uh, interchangeably throughout uh, the webinar, hopefully in context. So number one, what is crisis management? There's a lot of definitions, but generally it's the art of avoiding trouble when you can and reacting appropriately when you cannot. And for this webinar, I want to take uh, more of an organizational perspective and use this definition, which is crisis management is about preventing loss when possible and minimizing loss when prevention is not possible. So that's the basis we're going to do the webinar on. Number two, training leaders and staff. When you cannot avoid a crisis, we must act to effectively manage the crisis and minimize loss. Human beings placed in stressful situations will react and perform quite differently. Now remember a very good anesthesiologist I worked with for years. He and I have been involved in managing departments. He was head of anesthesia. We were working in a large uh, hospital in Riyadh for many years together and we've done all kinds of crisis and codes and, and developments together. And there, if there's anyone I'd like to uh, work with in a crisis or a code or emergency response, it would be him, Dr. Hans, he's from Sweden. And during the Gulf War, I remember him telling me, this is just to give you an example of human response. Um, I remember him telling me that during the Gulf War, there was the Scud missiles that were coming in from the North, from Iraq. And as they were detected, the air raid sirens would go off. And he was at home at the time. Um, and he went to his, got his mask. Everyone is issued with a gas mask. And he started to put it on. And the fear and the tension of the moments and the sirens going off. And this is a powerfully trained expert in emergencies. He said his fingers were like sausages. And he, and it took him, it should only take maybe 30 seconds or a minute, you know, very quick to put the mask on, get the straps, tighten them up. It took him minutes to actually get his mask on just because of the tension and the stressful situation he's in. Something to be very aware of. In a crisis, each minute counts and every employee has a role to fulfill and needs to be trained to do that role. The better you're trained, the more likely you'll just act and won't delay. Also, specific teams need training as well. For example, fire wardens, floor monitors, first aid, phone tree coordinators, the EOC, Emergency Operations Center, management and the teams, and, and many more. Also, um, training, uh, staff meetings, regular communication, updates and refreshers. These are also essential to again, engage and continue to keep the topic the interaction of crisis preparedness um, front and center. Some examples of training would be you've got to have the policy and procedures roles and responsibilities and protocols. So remember policy and procedures is how do you do something properly. Protocol is when and where you would do that and what triggers you to do that and what role do you play and, and, and how you carry those responsibilities. Workshops where these policies and procedures are explored, learned, practiced, and updated. You've got to keep them current. Uh, risk management courses, which is focused on knowledge and skill. Every organization out there, all of your organizations should have your staff, all your staff trained in risk management. And I know SMG has a very good um, risk management online course fundamentals that everyone should take the whole organization questions and answer sessions where it's it's not as as directed or instructed and people can just interact and discuss preparation and the whole uh, topic 
and get a feeling for and apply it in their world or their work, uh, work pathway. Case studies are very helpful where you can look at what happened in another circumstances and learn from that. Whether something went right or long, wrong, you can still learn from that. Drills, um, for example, fire drill, power failure drill, oxygen failure, and simulation, um, where um, you set up a scenario and you have the entire organization practice responding. I would differentiate between drills. It's just the way I look at things. It's not official. Where drills would be maybe a department or a team or service area would do their practice. Simulation would be the whole organization needs to practice together and how teams and service areas and the flow of the response all works together to make that crisis management work properly. And remember, after you've practiced, you need to debrief, or even if you've had an, an event, you want to debrief to make sure that you learn from your mistakes and you also recognize where things have gone really well. Any questions so far? Okay. It's, it seems there are no questions there. We can continue. Okay, thank you. Number three, conducting the crisis audits. First of all, what is an audit? An audit, a crisis audit, is an internal evaluation to identify potential crisis before they happen. It's also known as a vulnerability audit, where you're looking to identify potential crisis or threats that exist and what your preparedness is. Why audit? Conducting a audit will bring all the information, preparation, training, roles, resources, plans, everything together in one place and identify gaps that have not been addressed. So the point is to identify gaps. There are some companies who have done a lot of crisis management work already. They may have a fire plan chemical spill plan, many others, but they may not be prepared for an extended, say an electrical outage or a cyber attack. So those are the gaps you're looking for. Remember, prevention and reduction of loss is the goal. And we do understand, it's proven, that great value comes from preparing for crisis and preventing crises. There's also financial incentives it's estimating, estimated, this is from a, a WHO report that was written. Um, it's estimated that a dollar spent in loss prevention can prevent $7 in disaster related economic loss. I would wager that it could be a much higher ratio of one to seven. Continuing with crisis audits, here are some of the audit questions, and you need to customize the questions to fit the company and, and what your company does. But here are some examples. I'll give you eight examples. Number one, what is going on in the world that could affect us? Number two, do you notice any threats to safety here at work? How about threats to business continuity? Three, if there is an emergency this evening and you had to report to work off-site tomorrow, do you know how to work remotely? This is a question and, a, and a, a process that's happening all over the world. As we know, we can see in the media, in every country, everywhere. And it's also happening in a, in a significantly in schools and universities. Number four, are all remote access computers and equipment secure? Is critical company information backed up? If so, how often and where? Remember, there should be three backups. And one of those should be off-site. And you have to remember that in your backup process, you 
how much are you willing to reconstruct if you lose your information system and you need to go to your backup? You have to remember that. Is it two days that you want to rebuild? And, and it depends on how much information and data, new data that goes in every day. Number five, is there a place designated as an emergency operations center where work can be underway with minimum delay? Do you know the location? Have you been there to see if it meets your needs? Number six, do you understand your role in an emergency situation? And have you been trained for that role? Number seven, do you have access to contact information for everyone internal and external? How often is it updated? If your computer is unavailable, how will you access this information? That information is critical as you're effecting and implementing the critical uh, crisis management plan. And number eight, what areas of vulnerability do you see that could lead to a problem? And there's a chap named Bernstein, Jonathan Bernstein, who's well known for crisis management and training. And he says there's three types of, of uh, crisis. There's creeping, slow burn, and sudden crisis. Crisis, And we say there's sudden crisis and something just came out of the blue, but it's not uncommon for a sudden crisis to have first been a creeping crisis that was not detected or known but ignored and even used as a political bargaining chip. Known and ignored, for example, unfortunately, the, the the tragic event, event and explosion of ammonium nitrate um, in, in Beirut. That was potentially known and ignored, or maybe a political bargaining chip where um, <clears throat> some of the response to the pandemic we've seen in some countries where it, the response is potentially a political response. When you've conducted to the crisis audit, you want to use a risk uh, matrix to help put it into context. Reports are intended to be read, but sometimes after the audit is complete and reports are submitted to decision makers, nobody hears anything back and all that information and critical uh, details just it sits on a shelf. So a risk management or sorry, a risk matrix will help give a visual context to help busy leaders, decision makers, to quickly understand risk likelihood, potential impact, and priority. My approach is to keep things simple and translatable. So this is an example of, it's not too bad, but to me it's a bit complicated and a bit too busy. So here's, here's an example. You can make your own. It doesn't have to be like this, but I like to simplify and make it effective so people can act on it and they can see it in the, the snap of a finger. So on this, on this matrix, the top right would be high likelihood and high impact. So any event that goes in there um, would be in that category. And then on the bottom left would be least severe, which is low likelihood and low impact. And on the next screen, I'll give you an example of that. So you've done your audit. And now you want to perform a risk level analysis. And, and here's a, you want to use a, a basic um, categorization of the risks. And here's a, a four level or four category risk that goes with that risk management um, matrix. Risk uh, ma matrix. So category one, which would be the most severe, risk is high likelihood and high impact and it will require major organizational response. For example, there was a hurricane alert for your area and past storms have come through and caused devastating damage. So that's category one. Category, category two would be risk is low likelihood and high impact. You should be prepared and monitor. And an example is that there's a hurricane watch for your area, although a storm Storm has never struck your city before. Category three would be risk is low likelihood and moderate impact 
where the organization is concerned of the potential effects. An example, a bomb threat is called in by an individual who has made false threats before. Security measures make it unlikely that the threat is true. So the organization and access and access points have a, a very consistent security measures. And for example, you know that no one gets through and can carry a bag or a container or a box or anything past security, you have metal detectors, et cetera, et cetera. So you're pretty comfortable and secure in that. So that's category three. And then category four would be least severe. Risk is low likelihood and low impact. And the risk is unsubstantiated, it's unknown. So it's hard to quantify. And for example, there's a rumor that the local telephone company may go on strike. So you, you may wanna look at it and see if something did happen, what happened in the past, how long did it last, and what would be a, a, a plan B. And you'd use your mobile system, for example, mobile uh, phone system. So those are the four categories. So let's take those examples and place them on the risk matrix. So category one, hurricane, would be in the high likelihood and high impact. Category two would be low likelihood but high impact, of course. Category three, the bomb threat, would be in low likelihood and maybe moderate impact. And then number four, um, the phone company strike would be in low likelihood and low impact. And as you can see, it's simple to, to um, appropriate priority to the high likelihood and high impact. And we know it's a hurricane and you go, you set about to make sure you're prepared and everyone's ready. Usually easy to understand. Any questions so far? So if anyone has any question, please, you can ask them through the chat. Okay, everyone is saying they're okay. There is one, uh, I think, clarification. Uh, is there any other factors to consider when it comes to crisis management? Or are we gonna go through them now? Um, yes, we'll go through considerations and, and just the steps of, of the, the seven points that we've outlined. And then that might give a better picture and answer that, that question. Okay. Okay, sure, no problem. Okay, number five, the crisis response process. Step one is ensure safety. First thing is to focus on this in a crisis is personal safety and employee safety. Once employees are safe, then look to ensure the safety of everyone else in the area. Number two, perform basic crisis management steps. And this would include uh, human resources, security personnel, management. Call police or emergency response support. Secure work area where the incident has occurred. Preserve, preserve the scene's integrity while ensuring the safety of workers. Ensure that no area is left short staffed and that employees remain in groups. Remember to assess the scene for safety has, hazards like electrical wiring that's exposed, flooding, weapons, broken glass. Then also you can quickly debrief affected workers, including victims and witnesses. But remember, these conversations are, are, you have to keep those confidential. That's step two. Number three, if it's appropriate, activate the crisis response process. So once the scene is secured and workers are safe, management needs needs to decide if the incident warrants activating the crisis response process. 
And that means setting up an emergency operations center in a safe location and recording all the information that you need to collect on a whiteboard or flip chart so everyone's organized and you have an organized approach and everyone's on the same page. So the crisis management team, so you've activated the, the crisis response process, you've set up your EOC, and now you want to gather, make sure you have this information, which is a description of the crisis threat or threatening behavior. You want to determine what immediate actions you, you're needing to take, like calling the police. Um, determine if the threat is general. For example, it may be directed at the company, or it could be directed at a building, or it could be at a person. You need to determine who's involved in the crisis and, ver and observers and witnesses. You also need to determine if a team or manager has any knowledge of warning signs and what the signs were. You need to determine level of distress by persons involved in the crisis. Determine if threat requires immediate security or police presence or removal of employees from environments. And also um, you may need to determine availability of external consultants and contact them as needed. Some companies may not have the capacity to be focused or have somebody designated to managing the crisis. So they may um, hand that off or contract that out. And you need to be able to activate that when and where you, it's needed. Stay flexible. Remember the direction, the measures, and the actions that you take in this crisis response process, it really depends on the crisis. So you have to be very flexible and have a good plan in place. We'll go through that. And also um, think about your connections. Um, for example, most communities have access to about three days worth of food and water. So if your business is involved in healthcare or housing for vulnerable people, how will you be able to ensure resumption of food and water delivery. If your business, for example, is located in a floodplain, where will you go for weather data? And where will you get a reliable source for that? And how can you improve drainage, for example? So reliable information and connections are really critical. And all of these steps must be explained in the organization's emergency response plan. And you need to tailor that to the specifics of your business. Okay, number six, incident management techniques. This may answer some of the questions that, that came up or that question that came up. First of all, the goal is for no crisis events or emergencies. But we know that's not a reality. And there's human beings, machinery, and an inability to predict or behave predictably and safely in all instances. So when there's a crisis, there's an acronym for that. When responding to incidents, take charge. And the acronym is, T is take control of the situation. A is assess safety hazards. K is keep yourself safe. That includes stopping any machinery, removing yourself from dangerous uh, elements, and E, intake, ensure others are safe or remove them from dangerous environments. In the take charge, the word charge, C is call 911. H would be help any victims if you are trained and if it is safe to do so. Move victims as little as possible as it could aggravate their injuries. And also just if somebody's there and injured, keep them warm. A, activate crisis management plans. If appropriate, reassess the scene for new safety hazards, including bystanders. G, get control of the scene, make sure evidence is not disturbed. And finally, extract yourself, turn things over to the proper authorities, such as emergency response personnel or management. So when 
responding to a crisis, take charge. And that's a good acronym to keep in mind when you go into a crisis. Crisis management techniques, there's documentation that's required. Um, you'll be legally required to have an event of crisis for, depending on your business and, and where the crisis is, et cetera. But make sure you know what the, the documentation is required and have them ready prior to the crisis. Know what you need to document before the crisis. That should be ready. Here's an example of the information that you'd gather. Type of incident, date, time, location of incident, employees' personal information, work information of employees, people on duty, emergency response personnel, name of the hospital where the employees were taken, somebody's injured and, and they were taken off. Keep track of that. Witnesses' personal information and their testimony. And then a description of the incidents, timeline, events, damage, type of accidents, hazardous materials, etc. These will be required and, and you need to know what your jurisdiction, your area is required to do and make sure you have forms and capacity to record that and have that ready before the crisis. Also, there's some other documents which would be helpful, safety manuals, policies, materials that you can distribute to employees, um, things like that. Also with um, incident management and documentation, you will need to investigate the incident. And there's eight steps, which I'll just briefly go through. And there's also an incident investigation kit. And we can provide this information to you after the fact of who had the uh, webinar, but you'll need to have companies safety policy investigation procedures insurance information and notebooks pens um, handheld gps camera etc so you can have date and time a lot of things make sure you have that kit available and then with your crisis investigation document there, there's there's really eight things that you need to um, investigate and put into that document so you gather information, you identify the basic facts of the incident, who, what, when, where, and, and how, why will come later. Um, you need to, you want to do, uh, include a description of the crisis, timeline, witness reports, sketches, physical evidence. That's why you need that kit, investigation kit. Uh, determine your probable cause. For example, um, your, your aim is for prevention, not to blame. So your probable cause shouldn't be employee error. It should be lack of proper training in forklift use. So you're focusing, when you're looking for a probable cause, you're looking for something that's correctable, that's not blame, it's something that you can work to prevent. And number three, identify effective solutions for the probable cause. So do spend time in getting the probable cause correct. So when you go into effective solutions, it's actually effective. So there's gonna be three characteristics of an effective solution. The solution must help prevent a reoccurrence of the incident, must be something that you can control, and it must be in line with your organizational organization's values. So in, in the, the step two said, so okay, so um, the example was lack of proper training in forklift use was identified as a prob probable cause. Retraining the effective employee is not, retraining the effective employee is not an effective solution because it will likely not prevent a reoccurrence of the incident. So really, effective solution would be redesigning forklift training and recertifying employees in that better solution. So then employees have a better knowledge, 
how to operate the machine, the haz hazard is more likely to be resolved. Step four, assign, <clears throat> excuse me, assign responsible parties and reasonable target dates, dates of that solution. Identify the solution, put them into action, determine who will implement the solution, uh, what will be done, when it needs to be completed, how it will be evaluated, and who will monitor progress. Number five, write the final report. The report should include all the gathered data, probable cause, solutions identified, and the action plan for the solutions. Six, communicate results. Highlights of the report, what happened and what the organization plans to do. That should be communicated to the, all the employees. And you may want, want to give more detailed inform, information uh, to those affected by the crisis. Number seven, <clears throat> excuse me, track solutions. So the incident in, investigator will be responsible for tracking solutions as they are implemented to ensure they are implemented correctly and on time. Otherwise, what's the point? And then number eight, monitor the workplace for reoccurrences of the crisis. Did the solution work at preventing occurrences of the incident? That's the point of doing all of this. If it doesn't work, you need to reevaluate the probable cause and the effect of solutions. Go back to the beginning, reevaluate, get a solution in place, and then act on it. So that's incident management techniques and documentation for eight steps to take. Any questions so, so far? Uh, there was a question that where would the COVID-19 fit in the risk matrix, in the likelihood matrix? I think that's a very good question. COVID-19, and if you look at, um, it's interesting to look at prepara preparedness and response. And I've been monitoring and looking at countries and how they've responded. So, a sudden yeah. crisis, could it be a sudden crisis or would it be a slow burn, creeping crisis? Um, it seems like there was a lot of information upstream and there was a, a plan in place to deal with SARS epidemics and, and swine flu, et cetera, in the past. And that would have been used as a template or a plan to respond to coronavirus as it became known and information was put out. So if it was put on the matrix and looking at countries, and this is me looking at it um, from my perspective, I wouldn't put it on in the high likelihood, high impact. It's high impact, but it would be low likelihood, high impact. And the reason I'm saying mm -hmm. that is if you look at some countries that were aware and responded and prepared, they had very low impact. And now I'm, I'm talking in terms of, of a medical or people infected, overwhelming, if you have uh, this huge curve of hotspots and people getting infected, it overwhelms your healthcare system and it becomes like New York, what happened in New York or in Italy. So if you prepare and you're aware of it and you put measures in place, you never get to that high impact or high likelihood level. For example, if you look at how Taiwan responded, they put measures in place and they never had the high impact. If you look at it, like I said, from healthcare and overwhelming the system perspective. It never happened. Right. Also, if you look at what happened in New Zealand, same, okay? So it's a very good question, excellent question. 
And it varies depending on which country you look at. If you look at, obviously, in, in Italy, was it the fact that there was, it was known and it was ignored or it was known and it became a political issue? So would that be put into category one? Because it was ignored and then it became something and it, then it overwhelmed the system. Even health workers are dying because they don't have um, the right uh, protection devices, masks and the like. So I don't know if I can give you uh, the correct answer. And I would say it depends on what country and what situation you look at. South Korea is very good at identifying, locking down hot spots, and quarantining, okay. getting prepared and, and acting on that, putting a system in place. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. There's uh, <clears throat> a couple more questions. Okay. How could we differentiate between risk and crisis? Is there a differentiation between the two? Yes, one is um, preparedness and understanding risks, and it hasn't happened. The crisis, it's happening. It's, it's something that's already in place, and it's occurring. Okay. That's how it differentiates. Uh, Any other questions? And is there a crisis management uh, published standards like there are for quality and environment? It's harder to define exactly... Uh, crisis management because it's there's so many different types of crisis. So I would say generally no And it's it's most important. That's why I'm emphasizing that each company would have their own Audit system their own preparedness their own training and and awareness of what what to face and their own risks as to What they identify as gaps? But there are common practices, which I'm outlining today, as to how to deal with and prepare for and act when there is a crisis and or avoid it uh, entirely or reduce the, the effect. Perfect. So generally, the, the answer is no. And it's very, very important how the company organizes and trains and prepares and then responds. Yeah, well, there's uh, Mr. Tariq who shared that there is and we know about it. There is a standard about security and resilience crisis management. Mm, mm. 361. That's good. Good point. And, and again, that's in preparedness and responding and your resilience. So if you're prepared and you understand your risks and, and you're able to re either reduce, avoid, or, or mitigate when a crisis does happen, you are resilient as an organization. So that's a good point in that. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can uh, with, move on. With having those measures in place. Okay, so uh, number seven, business continuity and recovery. So when you determined what urgent and non-urgent aspects of the business need to be restored to maintain the integrity of the business and meet stake stakeholders' expectations, you will know what needs to be done first. So see, this is where it's hard to rule what you should do for your business every time because it's determined of what type of business, what kind of crisis you're in, and how you're going to move out of that in the context of your business and even your environment, your stakeholders, okay? So you want to review um, major function of the business to determine what activities are essential and how much time you can tolerate for any function to be unavailable. For example, a hospital can't tolerate the ER department shut down. So the, the, the tolerance for ER to be shut down would be zero. But in the same hospital, you may be able to tolerate the kitchen being unavailable for some hours, say three hours is a, is a kind of a standard timeline. However, is the, if the kitchen is destroyed, then the food would be secured from another location and you'd be able to stay within that three hour uh, limit. Another example would be a fast food restaurant. If it's shut down for 24 hours, probably won't matter and customers may go somewhere else, which you don't want, but it doesn't matter that much. 
another example would be a local state state department uh, building gets incapacitated in some way and they are not able to issue or reissue driver's license um, that's not a big deal for some days but if the they're not able to issue uh, social services benefits, that could be critical for a lot of people. Okay. So again, it's very <clears throat> relative and specific and an, an organization needs to be very aware and prepare and organize what's urgent and non-urgent depending on what they are, what their stakeholders are and their environment. So I just wanna go through continuity and, and those aspects. So first of all, have your crisis plan in place. There needs to be a copy of the plan available for reference at all times. And it's, you don't, it's not enough to have it on a computer server because your power might go off uh, and you, it's not available. So I recommend having a three ring binder with a noticeable and keep everything the updates everything up to, to snuff remember in in point three that's this is part of the continual preparedness process staff meetings regular communication updates refreshers all that's part of it so the organization of the um, plan this is what you're following now in your continuity and recovery be up to date easy to read well organized so it's easy to use. Table of contents at the front, index at the back. Clearly marked section tabs to assist in quickly locating information. There should be a preamble, introductions, purpose of the plan, statements of scope, policies, anything else that's helpful. Remember, um, there could be members of the crisis management uh, team that are not available and you want to bring somebody else in to, to you, you have to have that succession plan and you have to have all the roles functioning. So you bring somebody in that's a backup and they need to be able to get in, get up to speed in short notice and they're going to use the crisis management plan and all the documentation in there to get up to speed quickly. There's all, all should, also should be details note taking so members of the team can keep notes and incidents as they unfold and events that take place and decisions made. You need to be able to keep that there. And also any um, meeting minutes, notes, reasons for not implementing policy, et cetera, that should be there too. Job descriptions, um, make sure that these descriptions are understandable, straightforward. Anyone is, can step into the role unexpectedly and they'd be able to say, okay, here's what you need to do. That's your role. Uh, read this, you ready? Remember you've trained them, you've orientated them, and now you're in a crisis and they're, they're going to take on that role. So make it effective, manageable, and efficient. For example, if your spokesperson or CEO is injured, um, someone is going to have to set in and um, step in and be reassigned and promoted to that role. Uh, supplemental teams, you might have multiple locations and you have a team in each place and report back to central team at the headquarters and be able to act independently depending on the circumstances. And you need to be able to identify and manage and, and define how that's gonna go. Keep that up to date. As I said um, earlier, alternative team members, succession planning, um, have alternatives and their contact information for each team, especially the crisis management team uh, available uh, procedures for each scenario. This is so fundamental. So some, you've gone in, you've done your audits, you've assessed risks, and you have set up um, the common threats, and then you have procedures for each of those scenarios, and that should be in there, tabbed, uh, like fire, flood, power outage. And you should be able to go to that and act on it according to what is designed. Everyone's trained in it, Every, everything's organized, here's the steps and get on with it. You should be able to go to that, it's a fire, tab it, go. Spokesperson, spokespeople, they're, 
There should be one person who is appointed to speak for the organization during the crisis, and they need to be trained and ready to deal with the, the media, communicate with employees, families, uh, community. It could be, say, the person, a uh, CEO, but in some circumstances, um, or at certain intensity, it could be somebody else who's better at it. Or CEO is not available. Stakeholders, you need to identify who they are and make, be able to communicate with them. Is there, is there, was there a question? Oh, no, no, no. No, don't worry. Okay. All right. um, uh, I'm sorry, I have a question. Define... Oh, sorry, okay. there, there, is, there is a question, yes. Uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, as you have mentioned, that we have uh, four categories of crisis, from the most severe to the less one. Uh, right. So, my, uh, I have a couple of questions. In fact, so uh, my first question: uh, is there a way, or uh, uh, to, to to find a solution, a global solution that can uh, uh, that can uh, that covers uh, from the most severe situation. To the last one, for example, as we know, the explosion in Beirut, uh, the response to, to such a crisis differs from uh, another crisis, uh, like if we are talking about the pandemic situation. Ah, so yes. uh, can, uh, shouldn't we have a global solution uh, and uh, we can respond uh, uh, accordingly uh, depending on the crisis we are facing? And my, my, my second question, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the, uh, uh, knowing that uh, you, also you have mentioned that uh, maybe uh, to have a, an effective solution and to be efficient uh, to respond to any crisis, uh, we should have uh, knowledge, uh, all, all, uh, all participants or maybe all the employees uh, should, uh, should have knowledge on how to respond. So uh, we, uh, they should be trained. Uh, so how many times uh, shall we perform uh, 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 the drills uh, through the year, uh, maybe to be uh, to be uh, uh, familiar with with the crisis, because sometimes documentation uh, are not uh, available in our hands, and uh, we should respond without thinking. Ah, so very, uh, very good question. questions. Thank just, uh, very 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 good questions. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Um, the the first question about having a response uh, crisis response mechanism uh, on a global basis. If I if I got that question correctly, um, and and that's that's a very good uh, point. And we've seen as the the coronavirus pandemic has has um, gone throughout the world. We you can watch its progress starts in the east and goes west. Um, we've seen countries respond. So you're absolutely right. And and as you said, there should be a global response mechanism that everyone is is included in. And especially as we get these modern pandemics and issues that uh, circumnavigate the globe. So there, there are um, preparations and organizations like the WHO, which coordinate that. And unfortunately, um, it seems like politics gets in, involved in that, money gets involved in that, and power. So absolutely agree and it's how do you arrange countries and get them to cooperate and that's where the united nations and who is supposed to um, control that and then it seems like that's politicized so i don't know if i have a good answer but um, absolutely agree and that will save and appropriate the right response um, not only in one country but in all countries and then it comes down to funding and, and willpower and things second question about having people trained Again, excellent point and absolutely true. That's what we're doing with SMG. And every employee should have training. Absolutely right. Um, in risk management. So you're, you're getting every employee in the organization with eyes and ears and in monitoring. And they're seeing things from a risk a management point of view. So they actually start to interact with each other, with the management and with the goals of the organization to maybe um, identify things that are slow burn or creeping 
and it helps you avoid. So getting people trained, as you said, is absolutely correct and very essential in risk management and, and helping train them is also important for the trainers and, and managers. And then it's critical for if you're unable to avoid a crisis, the way you can optimize your response and reduce the loss from a crisis. And loss could be money, lives, operations, you name it, reputation. There's so many losses that, that could occur. So the way to reduce that is to have a crisis plan in place, what I'm going through here, and have everyone trained in their role on how to react and be part of that crisis management or crisis re response process. Two very good points, thank you. There's also one recommendation from Ms. Petra that uh, probably we should do make the crisis plan in more than one language. So, yeah. Absolutely, for example, I've worked internationally for years in, in various countries and and, and um, especially in, in the Middle East. So in our in our hospital, it was, it was one of the biggest hospitals in the military um, military um, medical system in Riyadh, in Saudi, and there was maybe on one team in one work area. There's probably about five languages that are spoken as their first language for the staff and the second language that was used between all the medical staff and the teams was English. So absolutely. But you want to make sure that you identify what uh, language you'll be communicating in and everyone needs to be checked off to be able to respond and know their role and, and be effective in that one language. If you get a crisis, Having multiple languages will uh, reduce the effectiveness of your response. I hope I'm answering the questions and, and getting to what people want to hear. So, but yeah. languages are critical. And I've been in situations where um, it was communicated um, from English to Arabic to Tagalog, back to English, and then a mistake happened. And all the people involved, I had to investigate it and, and get solutions and corrections on that. So um, everyone involved is really good practitioner, good clinician, and they really intended their job well. They're good people. But the language and the communication is where it broke down. And everyone is trying to uh, work on doing the right thing. But the stress factor was that it was an emergency. And everyone sort of reduces to what they feel is comfortable with and and everything got out of control. So that's critical. Other questions? There's one uh, question about, uh, I think this is a long debate, but if you can do it shortly that. Okay. Why did COVID-19 spread more and more advanced countries than the less developed countries, for example, in African countries? Remember on that slide where it's either creeping, slow burn, um, or sudden? Um, political, how about that? Political and, and, and poor, uh, um, poor management. I'm not trying to be political, but people didn't do the right job who were in leadership positions. Plans were in place, measures to respond appropriately and, and keep it from getting out of hand, getting out of control. They're all in place, everything was there, but it's the willpower and the ability to lead properly on behalf of the, the, either the state or the country. That didn't happen, unfortunately. And, you know, I'm not a political person, so I'm not stating that in a political sense, but it was that, unfortunately. should never have gone that far. And if you want to look at examples of how to do it politically right or as a, as a leadership, if you, if you take away politics and you just look at leadership and good management in a crisis, look at Taiwan, for example, that's one example. And what happened was, remember when I said learning and training and preparation, 
in, I think it was level uh, number three, um, learn from mistakes, learn from others, use case studies. So Taiwan had a case study of their own history, which they look back on, and I believe it was SARS or swine flu. Anyway, it got out of hand and they had a really bad response. A lot of people died and they, they didn't manage it properly. And that was, I think, I believe in 2001 or 2003. This time they said, we're not going to do that again and we're going to take the measures that we know will work. Respond to the pandemic. pandemic. Everyone knows how to do it. And they followed the plan and took the decisions and acted early, acted forcefully. And they've had like under 100 deaths and they've managed it well. For example, they, they started their organizing their manufacturing system so everyone could have a mask. I think three masks per um, citizen or resident per day. And they implemented that. They, they got tracking and they got testing in place. And when they identified a hotspot, they locked it down. So all the measures of how to deal with it are, are there. It's a matter of having the fortitude and the, the leadership of implementing it. So there are really good examples of how to do it. So back to the question, um, it could have been handled much better in several Western countries that have the capacity and knowledge and the plan in place to do it, and they never did. Okay, thanks, Dale. Uh, let's move on. Okay, let's finish up. This is the last point seven. Just going through the crisis plan. Um, stakeholders, we were talking about that. It's essential to have that in your plan and know who they are and how to communicate with them and how to identify them, them um, and keep in touch because employees, customers, contractors, suppliers, these are all your stakeholders and make sure contact details are there and they're up to date every 90 days, for example. Because when you're in a crisis, you need to have communication. Emergency operations center. So you've gone through step one, then step two, and now you're, you've, you've activated the, the crisis response. It's at that level. All the details of the emergency response center need to be in your plan team members and who's going to be there, contact information, etc. What's the available infrastructure, equipment, how to access the building, where the EOC is, is located, what items of support the team needs to bring, for example, radios, phones, water, food, generators, extension cords, first aid kits, computers, etc. That all needs to be there so they can just act. And then also, you need to define the chain of command. And decision makers are responsible for how this goes. And the details for the chain of command need to be there and up to date. These people are going to coordinate the activities during the crisis and look after all the issues and continuity and recovery. Also, the spokesperson needs to be a part of that. And then finally, the human side. Event debriefing. This is a critical part and the last section of the plan should have room for a summary where each member of the crisis team can make notes and things that are necessary to share after the incident is resolved. And I think I mentioned that earlier, but I want to reemphasize it here. Um, it should have comments that demonstrate strengths and weaknesses of the plan, recommendations. So even if you're affecting and implementing your crisis process and your plan, you also are monitoring and, and allowing people to uh, put information in there to help improve for next time. That's always your process. Staff debriefing. There should be a section for provision of counseling services for people involved. When there's a crisis, each of us handles things in our own way. Some people look for closure, others look to try and deny the incident. So I've, I've, the crisis I've been through and the things I've seen, um, it still disturbs me at times and, and when I try to sleep. So everyone has to deal with it. 
And as an employer, you need to be prepared for the range of reactions and emotions that come with any particular events. An emergency responder will have their reaction, witnesses have theirs, those who are uninjured, some who are injured, so accept it, it will happen. And these reactions are all perfectly normal and expected, um, and it's okay. And make sure that you have um, professional uh, help available to people and you accept and work with people to help them come back into um, you know uh, dealing with their crisis and, and how that went and then continuing to be a productive member of your team through the seven points uh, defining the crisis management um, training the audits also the risk level analysis being able to make that simple and powerful and effective, the response process management techniques, and then the whole recovery uh, crisis management plan and recovery continuity. And if I could summarize, summarize it, this is, would be it. Crisis management is about preventing loss when possible and minimizing loss when prevention is not possible. Final thoughts. Remember back Machiavelli's words from 500 years ago, and he said, and this is a common failing of mankind, never to anticipate a storm when the sea is calm. And my closing statement, viable organizations must be ready for emergencies because they are a fact of doing business. The worst plan is not to have any plan at all. And the best plans are tested, practiced across the enterprise and adjusted to ensure they work properly over time. Any questions? So thank that you, wraps Mark. us up. Thank you so much, Dale. Yes, now uh, the floor is open for your questions. Please send us any questions you have and we will answer them. There's actually a very interesting question here about, uh, uh, so the HR departments in any company, what right. training plans should they have for their employees or their staff to make sure they have the minimum competence for crisis management to deal with a crisis? Absolutely, good question, thank you. Um, the HR department is, is at varying levels in different organizations, so, um, it depends on the HR department, but ideally, let's talk in ideal form. They should coordinate and ensure every employee in their company has at least had risk management training, an online course. So an example for SMG has a really good fundamentals course. Everyone should go through that and have that training. From the company perspective, They've, they're developing the crisis uh, response plan and doing an audit, for example, doing all the measures I've just gone through with everyone. They've got that crisis uh, uh, process plan in place. Then it's useless unless you go through it with everyone. So everyone has a role. Everyone needs to know about it. Every needs, everyone need, uh, needs to know what's going to happen. And take the time to get everyone checked off in doing that. Then, thirdly, you must have people practice it. You can't just go through it and check people off, which you must do. But you must also have it in practice and have a simulation, a drill, like I, I mentioned. And then your company should be ready. If an event happens, or if you see something happen elsewhere in the world, <laughs> there's all kinds of, kinds of examples. Take the time to sit down and go through that and say, are we ready? Is that a crisis we haven't thought of? Do we have a plan in place? Get that organized or recognize that you're already prepared for it and keep practicing. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Dale. There's a question from Ms. Jenny. Is there a recommended frequency for the emergency drills exercises? I would say, 
uh, in my experience, and, and you, you could get all kinds of different recommendations on that, but I would say six monthly uh, um, in, in practice drills. So I'm, I'm stating that, I wanna clarify that. I'm stating that in the context of everyone has been uh, trained in risk assessment. You have your uh, crisis plan in place. Everyone's been informed and readied and, and checked off and trained in their role. You also have practiced it. And so now you, you're, you're very ready. You're, you're good as an organization. And then you have drills and, and simulations and response and follow-ups. I would say six monthly. Okay. Some, some companies might extend that out to two years, but a lot happens in six months. So you might be able to be a little more risky, but you might put it up to nine months or a year. But from what I've seen, be careful. Okay. Be, be more proactive than, than not proactive. So there's a question from Mr. Hassan. Is, is there a way to preserve evidence when you're not in command, meaning you're not the decision maker? Well, first off, you must preserve information. So if it's not being preserved and you as an employee and not in command have that as a dilemma, that needs to be corrected with the department or with the organization or bring a consultant in to help that change. So that should never be in place. So first of all, you should never have that problem. Um, but secondly, if, if you don't have a record, if it's not written down, then it then you'll always have debate and there might be liability there. There could be a legal liability from, from the company or from the government point of view. Document and have documentation that is expected and required by the government and for your organization or for um, licensing bodies and things like that. You must have means to do it and, and make sure you have it. I don't want to put you at risk or, or make you feel threatened or uh, worried about, um, you know, being in your, being a, a rogue person, but it's the responsibility of the company, individuals, and leaders to have that in place. Simple. There's a question from Mr. Abbas. Is there, um, for, you know, uh, experiencing the COVID-19 now, right. is it possible not to have an alternative working, you know, location since we're making people work from home? Maybe because this is a financial issue. Yeah, that, that, you have to play that by ear and, and, and how, how you're able to, basically you want to keep your operations running, mm -hmm. identify which is essential and which you can, you can lag or uh, not you know, need to, to spend as much resource and time on, but you have to have your essentials operations working. So if your essentials are uh, working without setting up an EOC, then fine. As long as you're safe and you're able to operate you're stable, safe, and functional, do it. Okay. And there's a question from Mr. Nathan. If you have a crisis management in place and you can prove it, implement it and everything, does this impact your insurance uh, premiums? Could they go lower? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. And you should check with, you know, I'm not sure if all insurance uh, companies in all countries are up to speed or if maybe they're caught out and they're, they're trying to get up to speed with this coronavirus that's you know wrapped around the world but definitely have it in place first of all just to make sure that you can reduce loss or even avoid it and if things happen you get your optimal results in a bad situation secondly that may benefit you in getting lower premiums on your insurance policy, but definitely engage. Once you have it in place and you can show evidence of that and you have practice and everyone's checked off, you got your plan, then I would definitely want to engage with the insurance company to let them know and see if that affects the premium and drops the premium. Perfect. And one more question for companies that sure. have been hit hard by the pandemic and their financial situation is not that great. Uh, what alternatives do they have in terms of implementing crisis management if they cannot implement you know, a comprehensive one? If, if they're already in the pandemic and they can't implement a, a crisis plan, is that the question? Uh, yes, they probably they, they, they like the resources or the financial means to, to have a good response. 
That's a very, very important question and difficult um, to deal with. Um, the worst thing is to have no plan at all. And there's basic measures that don't require a lot of money or any money, which would uh, be able to be implemented. So if you don't have a plan, then get a plan in place. And a lot of planning is just to make sure what if something happened, what would we do? And then preparing for that and getting everyone in the organization on the same page and identifying and, and um, training and, and checking them off in what their part is in the response when that event could happen. And that won't take a lot of money. That takes planning, organization, HR, management has to be supportive of everyone on the same page. And you also have to put it on documentation, get roles defined, uh, processes, things like that. It's more about commitment and doing it. Cost. Cost can be a factor if you bring expert consultants in to either manage a crisis or help you prepare and get organized and avoid or prepare to respond to a crisis. So, you know, you have to weigh the cost of what it takes to prepare and get organized versus what it costs to um, avoid it, not have a plan in place and um, just wing it and do what you can when it happens. But remember, a dollar in prevention and preparedness is equal to $7 in a disaster response uh, cost. Perfect. Um, okay, thanks, Dale. So we, we finished. I just want to share one more okay. quickly with everyone, please. This, is, this was just a brief... Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the webinar. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much. So this was just a brief overview uh, of crisis management. Obviously, this topic is way more detailed. So we have developed a more comprehensive and detailed courses that are online and that could fit the requirement of uh, com uh, competency for your, uh, uh, for your employees and staff. So we have, we can offer a single crisis management online course that is uh, that give you uh, eight credit hours. Or we have also developed uh, a diploma in crisis management and leadership. This diploma includes five courses. They are all fully online and self-paced. So you can take them at your own pace. And uh, they fulfill the requirements of the regulatory bodies or any third party audit that you uh, might have. So I just wanted to share this with you. I will also share them with you in an email. And if you have any questions about them, please feel free to ask us. Uh, this session has been recorded. We will send you the recording and also we will send you the presentation. Thank you so very much for attending this webinar. See you on the next one. Thank you.